Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Midcap. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here today and have this opportunity to kick off um, what I think is going to be a tremendous day um, and is the first, as, as uh, Fred mentioned, of several regional forums that we're hoping to have across the state. So um, congratulations to Western Maryland for leading the charge in, in this conversation. So I want to also thank Fred and Pam Deering, our hosts. Uh, sorry Pam couldn't be here today, but as well as Wendy Gilbert and Julie uh, Prosky hamlin from Maryland Online, and also our partners, as uh, Dr. Midcap uh, mentioned, um, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, as well as the Maryland Independent Colleges and Universities. So this is truly shaping up to be a statewide initiative, and I'm, I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit more about uh, most as we get into the uh, my talk here today. So as you heard in that introduction, I direct the William E. Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation at the System Office. Um, prior to that, I was at Lehigh. Um, it's hard for me to believe we're coming up on six years since I gave up a tenured position there to come here to Maryland, where the, I think really where the action is in terms of academic innovation. Um, we engage in a whole lot of initiatives, as you hear about in a minute, but including uh, things like, um, um, in addition to OER, adaptive learning environments, we're doing work with digital badging and so forth, but OER was really among the first things that we engaged in, and I'm excited to see the momentum is really beginning to build. Um, so, Maryland is actually an interesting state, as you can imagine, to do this kind of innovation work. Um, it's been called America in Miniature. I actually wasn't aware of that prior to coming here, but um, in reality, you know, in addition to the fact that it's small enough to allow day travel to meetings, um, we have a real diversity of environments. We go from the beach to the mountains, urban, suburban, rural. You all are really familiar with this, obviously. Um, you know, when you contrast, it, it, was it last week or two weeks ago, I was at Allegheny College in Frostburg for the day. The next day I went out to Salisbury for another meeting and you think, wow, you know, as you traverse the state, it's just really amazing to see the diversity of environments. And our higher education institutions, I think, reflect this diversity. Um, in addition to a robust set of community colleges that um, represent each of the regions particularly well, the system itself is made up, as you are probably aware, of three research intensive institutions, three HBCUs, a fully online institution, and a variety of regional comprehensives in, 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 as well. Um, so it's a great place as a microcosm of public higher education to be doing this academic innovation work and it's been truly my honor to be here doing that. Um, but in addition to being here in Maryland, um, more importantly, I've had this opportunity to build on the momentum that, at least out of the system office, was established prior to my arrival by Britt Kerwin, the namesake for the system, who was the chancellor at the time, and the USM, who began to envision early on, I think, that being a system office could mean a whole lot more than just keeping the lights on and the trains running on time. That there were some things that we might be able to do collectively that we aren't able to do as effectively and efficiently independently. And that there might be some ways that we could add value um, to our institutions by working together, as Dr. Midcap said. Um, and in fact, that's what the Kerwin Center has been all about, finding those sweet spots, the places where we can add value in systemness, working collectively, um, and, and making sure that we're doing what we can to help support the institutions that, that we're working with. So starting in 2006 with the launch of the system-wide course redesign initiative, it was clear to me as an outsider that Maryland was interested in addressing the pressures on higher ed collectively and serving populations that most need the opportunity to advance through education. So as I said, Maryland's been a great place to do this work. As it turns out, however, Maryland does not make such a good cutting board. This was the... Uh, <laughs> housewarming gift I got from my mother-in-law when we moved to Maryland and um, <laughs> I love the state dearly but yeah it's not a good cutting board. Um, I wish she'd gotten us one while we were still in, in Pennsylvania. <laughs> but if you're interested you can get these at Bed Bath & Beyond so um, go, go check it out. So the Kerwin Center's uh, mission and vision is to create state, a statewide culture of academic innovation that catalyzes new ways of thinking about impacting student success, translates ideas into action to solve specific problems, and scales and sustains promising practices. 
the idea is for us to capitalize on recent findings from the learning sciences and the capabilities of emerging technologies to increase access affordability and achievement and then to find the things that are working best and, f and, and support the institution's efforts to scale them and sustain them over time. So as you can see, there's no mention in here of OER at all. Um, as I said, um, I view OER as one of the many arrows in the Kerwin Center's quiver, if you will, um, that we can use to facilitate change at our institutions, along with online learning, learner and learning analytics, alternative credentials, and competency-based approaches to curriculum design, just to name a few. Also, given my background, um, as Dr. McCap mentioned, I, uh, my background's in instructional design and technology. I know, so from that lens, I tend to view the challenges we face very much as an instructional designer, which I think will become clear to you here pretty shortly as I uh, frame um, my remarks for the day. So the Kerwin Center set out to fulfill that mission starting 2013, the year of the MOOC, which you might recall. Oops, went, went too far. Shoot. There we go, the year of the MOOC, there's my MOOC joke. And if you've been paying particular attention since then, you know that much of the discussion in the media about innovation in higher ed has been premised on the idea that if faculty would just adopt these bright new shiny objects, somehow miraculously everything in higher education would be fixed. But unfortunately, as many of you may be aware, the history of technology use in education over the last hundred years or so paints a rather bleak picture of the extent to which technology in and of itself can actually achieve this goal. Now, Thomas Edison. It was, in fact, just a little over hundred years ago in 1913, shortly after he had invented the motion picture that Edison claimed in an interview that the best use of his new invention would be for educational purposes because it was now possible to teach, there we go, to teach every branch of human knowledge with the motion picture, and that books would become completely obsolete and scholars would be instructed with the eye. He was so enthusiastic over the motion picture's instructional potential that he predicted educational films would change schooling completely within 10 years. Similarly, in the 30s and 40s, it was widely expected that the combined effect of radios, voice, sound effects, music might gain learners' attention and stimulate their imagination. So when educational radio came on the scene, pundits claimed it had undreamed of possibilities for education that would resurrect the oral instructional techniques employed so successfully by famous teachers of the past like Socrates. And my personal favorite, that could have been lifted directly out of a New York Times Thomas Friedman article from 2013. You remember those that he was writing? There will be vast universities of the air with courses taught by national leaders of their field. And so these patterns have repeated over and over again. In the 50s and 60s during the baby boom, television was touted as an, effect, an efficient and in, inexpensive way to satisfy the nation's instructional needs. And in the 70s and 80s, mainframe and then personal computers were predicted to provide students access to the personal services of a tutor as well-informed and as responsive as Aristotle. It turns out, as one traces the history of technology use in education, there's an there are incredibly clear patterns that emerge. First, this initial enthusiastic claims of the educational benefits. This is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's going to revolutionize education. Education as we know it will cease to exist. The new technology bowls everyone over as they hurry to figure out what to do with it without a set of guidelines or a foundation of research to suggest best practices. And then come the logistical difficulties. Difficulties with classroom implementation. Little consideration being given to the practic practicability of working with the new technology in the classroom. When educational film came out, there's some great stories um, in some of the New York uh, magazines in the New York City School District um, that talk about th how the um, film projectors would overheat and then catch fire. <laughs> really not practical. Um, often uh, radio shows lasted longer than class periods, um, no effort to align content of programs with curricula, and huge expense of purchasing and maintaining the equipment. 
But the biggest issue often was little to no instructor training, often training in functions rather than what to do with the technologies themselves. So you'd learn how to print. This is where you go to uh, communicate with students and so forth. But no help in understanding how do I incorporate this into my teaching? How do I work with this, these tools in my pedagogy? And consequently, it ends up being a huge lift, heavy lift, as Dr. Midcap said, for the instructors, for the faculty that are trying to incorporate these tools. Then, oops, one too many. Then last but far from least, the research begins to trickle in. Research comparing technology-based instruction to traditional methods that yields no significant differences. And then we dismiss the whole enterprise out of hand on the basis of an underlying lack of instructional substance and move on to the next thing. Sound familiar? Right, we just kind of recently went through this with the MOOCs. Everybody was certain it was going to change education as we know it. And then we discovered, well, holy cow, look, holy cow, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I really didn't mean that pun. <laughs> holy cow, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, we got all these students dropping out. We have all these students that aren't necessarily benefiting from, from the, the hard work that we're doing in developing these, these technologies. And in the end, the basic act of teaching turns out to be changed very little over the last hundred years, despite all the hype. And the technologies that have transformed a whole range of businesses, such as car manufacturing sector, the retail sector, haven't had the same transformative impact on education. For education, like nursing and other labor-intensive sectors that rely on human interaction or activities, the technologies we've had available to us to date simply haven't been capable of producing the kind of growth in productivity, a bad word, but productivity over time to transform the way we're doing business as educators. Stated differently, it takes nurses the same amount of time to change a bandage today as it did 50 years ago, and the same holds largely true for education. It takes the same amount of time for a professor to mark an essay today as it did 50 years ago. These are hands-on, labor-intensive activities. This cost disease was first discussed by William Baumel and Bill Bowen in the 1960s. Um, and at the risk of getting into way too much economics before in the morning, um, let me just describe a little bit of what this, this graph is showing. Um, with, technical, with technological innovations in some sectors, so looking at that top row, productivity increases at a rate similar to or even greater than the rise in wages for the workers in that sector, which results in a decrease in the cost per unit. The problem is with the introduction of those same technologies in other industries, like education, the wages still increase, but the productivity does not, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned on the previous slide which results in an increase in cost per units over time. And what, the, what is really interesting about this that Baumel and uh, uh, Bowen pointed out is that when this happens, the industries in that upper row start to exert tremendous pressure on the industries in that lower, lower row, which for higher education at least translates into things like you're not graduating enough students for 21st century jobs and even the ones that you are graduating don't have the skills we need. So I think it's an interesting matrix here to describe some of these things that we're, we're experiencing in higher education. So that's depressing. <laughs> it's a rainy Friday afternoon. You're all here to learn how to use OER and I'm just standing up here and being a buzzkill. But the technologies that have revolutionized other industries and hold such great promise for transforming higher education won't ever lead to meaningful change unless we find a way to break this cycle that we've been observing over time. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a step back for a minute and explore this assumption that simply inserting new bright, shiny objects into the mix can fix things. Let's go back to our definitions. I was an English major. Probably not a lot of English majors in this room because we, yeah, there we go, all right, excellent. I, I believe very much in the power of words. Um, so let's take a look at a minute at this definition of technology. So you ask most people what technology is and they're gonna point to one of these devices and say, that's, that's technology, my cell phone, my, my laptop, my, my HD TV. But if you look up the definition of the word, you'll discover that scholars actually define it much more broadly. 
as the application of our knowledge about tools, techniques, or systems to solve practical problems. So in addition to the fact that this term is really defined much more broadly by many, there's a few things that should strike us about this definition. First, in some respects, technology is actually more of a verb than a noun. While it involves some sort of thing, a tool, technique, or system, it's the application or how we use the thing that's key. Second, note that what's actually being applied in the definition is our knowledge of the thing. This suggests we much, must have a keen sense of the affordances or action possibilities the thing provides upon which we might capitalize. And I'll talk in a minute about what I mean by affordances. And the third aspect of this definition is that it presupposes some practical problem that we're trying to solve. You might even say that without that practical problem, it, you can't call a thing a technology at all. It needs to be in, applied in service uh, to the solution of some problem. So stated differently, in order for technology to help us get results, we need to really be certain of the underlying problems we're trying to fix and have a thorough understanding of the capabilities of the available tools, techniques, and systems to address those needs. So let's take a second and walk through these, these three aspects of this definition together. First of all, what is the practical problem we're facing in higher education? Now, I'm, of course, you know, each institution is going to have their individual things they're going to focus on, but let's look broadly across higher education. I think the big practical problem, of course, is boils down to how do we figuring out how we do a lot more with a lot less. During the past 10 years, as you all are aware, the financial meltdown of the Great Recession of 2008 and its aftermath have created funding shortfalls and altered campus revenue streams, shifting higher education from what economists perceived as a public good to a private good. The Great, great Decession de decimated state budgets, and while we've had financial downturns before, in the past, higher ed eventually recovered from those dollars, but it doesn't appear that's going to happen this time around. Only six states have had higher ed budgets return to, to or surpass their pre-recession levels. And in 19 states, expenditures per student are at least 20% lower than before the recession, leaving higher ed institutions scrambling to find alternate sources of revenue. Now, we've been fairly lucky in, in Maryland over the last uh, couple of administrations. They've been very supportive of higher education. But even here, we're feeling the pinch in our, in our budgets across our institutions. So as institutions seek alternate sources, part of the revenue, of course, comes from tuition increases. A recent study at a temple found that for every 1,000 in funds cut by the state, colleges raised tuition by about 300. At the beginning of the last decade, college students who went to public universities paid for about a third of their education. Today, in more than half the states, they're paying for most of it. So a huge shift in, in um, who's bearing the, the cost of higher education. Additionally, as you all are very aware in the community colleges in particular, our student demographics are changing dramatically. The non-traditional student is becoming the traditional student, with nearly one half of students who are currently enrolled in higher ed now fitting into this category. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the 17 million Americans enrolled in undergraduate higher education today look very different than when I went to school and most of us in this room went to school. One in five is at least 30 years old. One in four is caring for a child. About half are financially independent from their parents. A quarter take a year off before starting school. Two, in five, two out of five attended a two-year community college before coming to a four-year. 47% go to school part-time at some point, And 44% have parents who have never completed a bachelor's degree. Unfortunately, too few of our four-year institutions are adequately addressing these changes in demographics. I'd argue our two-year institutions are doing a much better job at that and have much been much better prepared for this shift, but the four years desperately need to catch up in many cases. Particularly with respect to these students' constant competing tension between obligations and or excuse me, family and life obligations and educational obligations. This sends students the message that this place is not made for me and leads to issues with retention. We need to rethink what, who, who today's post-secondary students are and figure out how to serve their needs. But how do we do all that while budgets are shrinking? So if that's the big practical problem, what do we know about the tools that we have available to us? 
The key to understanding what the tools provide is in having knowledge of what psychologists call affordances, as I said earlier. And affordance is the relationship between the tool and an individual that affords the opportunity for that individual to perform some action. So what the heck do I mean by all that? Well, for example, a switch affords flipping, a button affords pushing, a knob affords twisting. We can walk up to any of these light switches and just by the way they look, understand how we should interact with them in order to make something happen. That's an affordance. Affordances of tools can be used both to suggest and also to help shape action. So you've seen these now all over the place, right? Um, you know that you can't get your bottle into that little skinny blue slit. You're going to have to put it in the green round hole, right? That is an affordance that helps to shape action um, by the people using the tools. And in some cases, a tool's affordance can also create barriers to action. <laughs> this is uh, from the cover of a book called, Donald, or called uh, The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman, um, who is kind of my guru about this whole conversation uh, with respect to affordances. So affordances can create barriers to action. This is a great example. But think about the extent to which some of our facilities create barriers to action. This is a really difficult room in which to teach a flipped course for example. This room shapes the action of lecturing and prevents other kinds of activities from going on. So with the understanding that we have of the practical problem for higher ed and at least beginning to understand what we're talking about with respect to affordances of tools, the next step is to decide exactly how we'll make best use of those tools and to figure out how we avoid the temptation to use the tools to do things the same way we've done them in the past. This functional fixedness, as psychologists call it, was illustrated by Mayer's two-string problem in 1931. The participants were required to figure out a way to tie two strings together, even though when holding onto one string, the other was out of reach. A variety of objects were available in the room for use in the solution of the problem, like you can see on the desktop there, including a pair of pliers. So as you can imagine, most of the participants walked into the room, grabbed the pair of pliers, and used them to try to extend their reach toward the other string, which didn't work. It wasn't far enough. Can anybody imagine what the solution was? Thinking differently about the affordances of the pair of pliers? There you go. I see the pendulum going back there. Yeah. There you go. The weight of the pliers was the affordance to capitalize on here. So the solution was to tie the pliers to one of the strings, get it swinging, and then you could grab it while you were holding on to the other string. Whole different way of looking at that tool and thinking about the application of it and solution of a practical problem. Functional fixedness. Our functional fixedness in education is perhaps most clearly illustrated by this 1927 photograph that Cuban discovered in his research on constancy and change in the classroom. Can you see what you're looking at here? It's not a school bus, but you're getting on, it's an airplane, yeah. So this was a unique opportunity um, in the 1920s in Los Angeles for students to experience geography firsthand from the windows of an airplane. What, what have they done with this tool? <laughs> well, no, it's, I, I assume it's flying. I don't actually know if it is or not, but they, they completely missed the, the whole point, right? So they've, com they've completely replicated a classroom inside. Um, she's standing in front of a chalkboard under a clock and pointing at a globe. <laughs> Kids aren't looking out the windows. They've probably been told to pay attention to the teacher while she points at the globe, not look out the window. So they've completely missed the point here, the affordance being the wings and the fact this thing can fly. Not to mention the fact that, you know, who knows if they were even having a problem teaching geography or not. You know, my guess is this was, it, it, somebody donated these planes and said, okay, schools, figure out what to do with them. And they thought, okay, geography. Um, but, you know, clearly not making uh, practical use of, of the affordances of the available technologies. So let's apply this idea to our recent experience with MOOCs as another example. Thinking about MOOCs like that pair of pliers or like that airplane, what is the one affordance we've failed to really capitalize on? 
massive open online courses. Well, we always, of course, have had courses. We were doing online education prior to MOOCs. That wasn't really new. I mean, certainly we weren't doing a lot of it at that point, but Maryland Online's been around since how long? 99? 20 years. That's right. Shoot, I knew that. Uh, the anniversary's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, 20 years we've been doing online, so the MOOCs didn't bring that new to us. Um, open, you know, we can have a whole conversation about whether MOOCs are really open or not. Um, most people in the OER community would s say no, no, they're not. Um, they're just free. Um, the one affordance that I think we really missed out on was this massiveness piece. Sure, we used massiveness to, you know, to exhaust this whole idea about scalability of education. But what about the opportunities that massiveness can afford for community connections and worldwide collaborations among learners? This connectiveness, connectivist, excuse me, vision is best explained by researchers such as George Siemens and Stephen Downs who have envisioned capitalizing on the MOOC's massiveness affordance in terms of what they call X MOOCs and C MOOCs. So what they said was, sure, go ahead and, and scale, use the scale part, the X MOOC, use the scale part of massiveness to increase access to learning about core skills, concepts, those sorts of things. Then capitalize on the affordances of being together in a face-to-face -face environment where a teacher would help guide students in authentic project-based application of the skills and concepts that had been introduced in the X MOOC. Then go back into the MOOC environment in something they call a connectivist MOOC, a C MOOC, that capitalizes on how the massiveness brings folks together to do things like crowdsourcing solutions to wicked problems and building community around doing. That is a really unique use of the massiveness affordance and looking at it very differently like the weight of that pair of pliers. Thinking differently about how it can help us do things differently in teaching and learning. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about technology. So now I'm into this, how long have I been talking up here about uh, 20 minutes or so? And I have not yet mentioned OER. <laughs> so how are we doing with OER? Well, just like the massiveness of MOOCs, it was going to scale education and make it affordable and accessible to the masses, the freeness of OER has been the thing everybody has jumped all over. And there's no question that the OER movement has made huge strides along those lines. Please don't get me wrong, saving students money is very, very important. But have OERs begun to change the way we do things? Or are we simply replicating what we've always done in the past, swapping textbooks for OERs and calling it a day? As I said, please don't get me wrong, I love free stuff. Free stuff actually got UMUC on Jeopardy not too, too long ago. I don't know if you all were aware of this. Um, the answer, of course, is? The answer is? No, the answer is? What are textbooks? Thank you. In the form of a question, please. So, you know, free can be really good. In fact, when you talk to legislators, they love free. In fact, um, it was, uh, gosh, now it's going to be three summers ago that I had the honor of uh, speaking to a joint uh, committee of the Senate and delegates in Annapolis about the work we were doing with OER along with uh, then Provost Marie Sini about what they'd been doing at UMUC. Um, and boy, I got to tell you, as soon as you start talking about millions of dollars in student savings, their eyes just light up and they say, okay, what can we do to help? Um, this is a picture from the bill signing in 2017 for the Textbook Cost Savings Act, um, which charged the most initiative with beginning to do exactly the work that we're starting now to, to begin creating this environment where we can be having this statewide conversation about how to increase efficiency and effectiveness in our OER work at our institutions. Um, we were honored with, uh, to have gotten $100,000 to support that work and that's actually the, that supported, largely supported the summit that we did in December of 2017 um, that brought everybody together as an initial launch of this work. Um, and I say honored because usually, as you may be aware, um, budget 
monies in the state budget don't ever get added during the legislative session. They only get taken away. The, it, Maryland's unique in that sense that uh, the state budget gets set and then all legislators can do is strip the stuff away. This actually got added to the budget this year, that year. So um, the governor is very supportive. Um, we actually went back to the governor this year for some additional funding that didn't happen, but the governor's office is still really interested in continuing the conversation. So everybody cross your fingers next legislative session. Um, but as I've often said in these talks, um, it was about uh, two or three weeks after we got the announcement that we were getting, that the bill had passed, we were getting $100,000, that we received news that uh, Governor Cuomo had given SUNY and CUNY $8 million and proceeded to give them an additional $8 million each year after that. Um, the good news about that, no sour grapes, um, is that they've been really, really collaborative partners over the last three years and we've been doing a lot of interstate work back and forth sharing ideas and uh, helping to advance the conversation. So anyway, I digress. So, so free is good. Free certainly gets legislators' attention. But, whoops, one too many, once again. But you may have, he have heard this, this joke before, that OER is free like a puppy. <laughs> you know, once you get the free puppy, You've got the care, the feeding, the maintenance, the bones, the training, the, you know, doggy daycare, all these kinds of things. We're coming to realize that the care and f feeding of that free OER puppy isn't so free for our institutions, who, as we've already discussed, are already increasingly resource strapped. Several of us, including SUNY and CUNY and other statewide initiatives, are trying to figure out what OER is in fact going to cost our institutions per student per course in terms of actual dollars and human resources expended. While it's going to take us a, lot, a little while to figure that out, however, let's just say, for the sake of argument, we decide, we figure out it's $25 per student per course. What happens when the publishers are finally able to get their offerings of copyrighted materials down to $25 per student per course? Or, since they're really good at this and actually have been doing this for many years, what happens when they get it down below $25 per student per course? Do we sort of pack up our bags and say, yay, we won, we finally got them to reduce their cost and, and call it a day? When we get to that point, what is the value proposition of open? And how do we sell that to our faculty, our administrators, our regents, our legislators? Let's go back for a minute and look at that definition again. What else do we know about the affordances of OER in addition to the fact that they're free? While being free is awesome, the free part is actually a byproduct of the open affordance itself. So OER is often defined as resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So the free part is a byproduct. It's not the affordance. It's just what is made possible by the fact that OERs make up or comprise the five R's. The ability to retain, make, own, and control your own copy of the content, to reuse, to revise, adapt, adjust, modify, improve, or alter the content, to remix, and to redistribute. The real affordance of the openly licensed instructional materials are these things. Those are the affordances we should be focusing on. And what are we trying to accomplish? What's the need? Getting back to our definition. Well, I mean, unequivocally, we're about student success, right? And for at least us in the Kerwin Center, getting to student success is about access, affordability, and achievement. And the OER movement has been doing a really great job across the bottom because things are less expensive. We've been able to increase access. We've been able to provide day one access to materials and so forth. But I would argue we've, as Dr. Midcap mentioned earlier, we've spent less time focusing on the top of that iron triangle. And I call it an iron triangle because the reality is, in the past at least, increasing all three of these things simultaneously has been almost impossible. As you increase achievement through higher quality, typically you're increasing costs at the same time and maybe decreasing access too. 
As you increase access, it tends to become more costly. So these things have a reciprocal uh, uh, relationship that can make it very difficult to, to, to simultaneously move the needle on all three. I actually think OER, openness, is going to get us there. I actually think OER is the super affordance. <laughs> and that is, by the way, not an openly licensed <laughs> image. So when you get the PowerPoints, please be sure to delete this slide. <laughs> I think that OER and open in particular can be that super affordance, but only if we're willing to build on the successes we've already realized based on the free part and use the affordance to also change the way we're currently teaching, using data more effectively to assess the impact on student achievement, and then redesigning when we discover w when, that we haven't gotten things quite right. That's, to me, the value proposition. This is the thing that really is exciting about OER beyond just the free part, which I do think eventually that hopefully will disappear, the, the need for us to be so concerned about the exorbitant cost of textbooks and other published copyrighted materials. So what I'm talking about here, of course, is a continuous quality improvement loop. Um, this is the instructional design version of that, the ADDIE model, where you analyze, design, develop, implement, evaluate, and then repeat the cycle. I don't, it doesn't look like you can see the circle there, but there's a circle with arrows that goes uh, in a clockwise uh, direction. I'm talking about continuous quality improvement, which of course is a term that isn't often used in higher education. And it's going to require fairly significant culture change in our institutions in order to implement. So let's come back to a minute to, to that not so free OER puppy, which I am really seriously worried about. Um, and this was a message that I delivered to the um, um, open ed community when I had the opportunity to, to give this talk then as well. Our higher ed institutions are in no position to take on all the roles that publishers have served for us in the past. I was at UMUC actually and have been doing some consulting there and um, as you're probably aware they've moved entirely to what they're now calling zero cost instructional materials because they've come to realize as quickly as they made that transition they didn't actually, they weren't able actually to keep up with the digital rights compliance and uh, um, not all of the materials are necessarily open, although they're, they're going back to fixing that now. And, and one of the faculty there looked at me at one point as we were having this conversation about what OER meant for higher education and she said, well, we're essentially trying to take on the role of publishers. And I thought, holy cow, once again. Um, you know, how will our institutions do that? How will our resource straps in institutions, you know, the, the, I know for a fact in the, in the system, you know, Coppin State University where we've got students that really desperately need access to less expensive instructional materials and support in their learning, you know, how is a Coppin going to manage this? In order to sustain this work, we've got to find some ways to create efficiencies across the sector to avoid bankrupting the very institutions we're serving, who are also serving the students who are most trying to help. We need access to inexpensive digital rights and accessibility compliance services. We need better support for curation, including national standards around meta tagging and cataloging for OER discoverability. We need more OER materials at higher levels. We need training for faculty and students on how to teach and interact with OERs. Again, one of the things UMUC has been finding is that there's a whole new conversation around academic integrity as we begin to work with OERs in our courses. How do students interact with these materials? How do they understand how to cite them um, and reference them and so forth? We need to figure out how to support our institutions when their bookstores start closing down before they've had a chance to move entirely over to OER. Um, uh, Dr. Metcalf mentioned the, uh, the MAC meeting that I had the opportunity to speak at and the president of Chesapeake College asked me that very question. His bookstore was talking about packing up and leaving because their um, uh, revenues have been going down so much as they've been adopting OER. We need a set of unified standards and a system for review of OER quality and peer review of content. And we need a system that incentivizes faculty not with money but with a reward system similar to the citations index or something like that that we use for scholarly publications. And I'd like to spend just an additional minute on that last idea. Um, this slide is 
really washed out, so it's hard for you to see. But what I'm re -envisioning, envisioning is something like SOTL, the uh, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning on Steroids. So you know how that works. Um, the light bulb at the top is talking about, you know, gathering from the, the literature, the things that are working and not working in teaching and learning. Implementing the, the next little circle on the right is, is looking at, you know, implementing that in a course and engaging in that continuous improvement I was just talking about. Um, down the next bluish bubble is about getting peer, your, the work peer reviewed and eventually published in a course that cycle moving in uh, con continually like uh, continuous improvement. What if we could get to a place where in addition to this, we also had the ability to assess our contributions to teaching in a much more quantified way. Where as we are developing OERs or adapting OERs or uh, tweaking them to work with certain kinds of learners, we can contribute that back to the community and because they're digital, because they're indexed, that actually becomes like a citations index for you about your contributions back to teaching. So when you've developed that at Garrett and somebody at Frostburg adopts it, that trail goes along with the materials and you're actually able to cite that as something that you've contributed back to teaching. A much different way of assessing teaching and contributions to teaching than, for example, the course evaluations that we struggle with every semester. Just a thought. Now I'm not naive. I know that none of these things are going to be easy undertakings. In fact, in order to do this work, as Herb Simon said from um, Stanford, or excuse me, he was at Carnegie Mellon, we're, only, we're, we're going to need to convert teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. We can no longer expect faculty to be able to lift all of this on their own. We're going to need instructional designers. We're going to need support from our library uh, colleagues. Um, we're going to need to work at this together. And that, of course, is the premise from which we're working in the Maryland Open Source Textbook Initiative. Most began that first year that we started the Kerwin Center. In fact, I was sit sitting at my desk staring at a blank sheet of paper trying to figure out what it meant to be directing a center for academic innovation when I essentially got a knock at the door uh, from the then U University System of Maryland Student Council president who said they wanted to make textbook affordability their big project that year. I thought, great. I wasn't sure what we were going to do anyway, so this is a good idea. <laughs> Um, I knew about this much about OER. I knew David Wiley, so I knew I knew somebody that knew something about OER. And I thought, and this is, you know, I get to work with students again, which was really exciting for me. And the next thing the student council president said to me was, okay, so we just have two stipulations. First of all, it can't just be about USM. If we're going to do this, we need to in, in, in involve the community colleges as well. Perfect. I thought that's a great idea and it has turned out to have been a brilliant idea because as I look at this conversation about OERs and instructional materials, of course, why not ta have this conversation with respect to transfer pathways and making sure that the two-year and four-year institutions are talking about adopting similar kinds and developing similar, similar kinds of materials for courses that, that transfer. So good, okay, you got me on that one. He said, okay, the second thing that we must insist upon is that we're going to write a, uh, we're going to draft legislation that we're going to take to Annapolis that will require all faculty to adopt OER in the next two years. I said, well, okay. Uh, you know, that, that hasn't worked so well in other states, I said. And I said, you know, we have the opportunity to capitalize on all this course redesign work that had been happening across the state prior to that. I think we've got a coalition of the willing. Let's see how faculty do with this. But we're going to have to build awareness. We're going to have to work together to figure out how to help under, the faculty understand that, yeah, $250 for a textbook is a huge burden on students, particularly at our community colleges where that exceeds the cost per, the average cost per credit for tuition. So they agreed and actually that became part of the mantra that we have continued to, to um, you know, put forward from the most initiative, which is that the choice of instructional materials has to remain the purview of the faculty. That above and beyond anything else. So at the end of the day, if it's not about student success, if it's not about ensuring that students are having access to the best materials possible, we're making a big mistake. We can't sacrifice that for, you know, just slavish adherence to OER. 
we have to be really, really thoughtful about that. But if we can find that sweet spot, that balance in that iron triangle between access, affordability, and achievement, and also do it with openly licensed materials, I think it's a big win because, again, we can engage in that continuous quality improvement loop. All right, so a little more on most. Um, we've just recently gone back and looked at uh, the mission for most. Um, which, as we talked about earlier, is being led by the Kerwin Center, but in partnership with Maryland Online, uh, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, and the Maryland uh, Independent Colleges and Universities Association. So, Mac, Mikua, and Maryland Online. And with support from the Hewlett Foundation, we're giving, being given this opportunity to find ways to support long-term statewide scaling and sustainability of fully accessible, openly licensed course materials. The idea is for us to figure out how we can provide that infrastructure that will support the institutions to do this work. Also, we're dedicated in our mission statement to empowering and rewarding faculty who do these things, who capitalize on the opportunities afforded by openly licensed materials and optimizing student learning through continuous quality improvement. In our mind, that's the only way this is going to be sustainable. You know, we can, we can talk about sustainability in terms of, of costs and resources, but really it's got to be about reward structures and about supporting the faculty in this work. So that's actually in our mission statement. Our three-part goal is to shift the conversation about OER from being just about affordability to about student success, as you've probably gathered. Um, to support effective and efficient adoption, creation, and adaptation of OER to optimize student achievement and to develop processes, models, and reward structures for sustaining the work over time. That's what we're moving forward on. Um, we're engaged right now in a listening tour. Um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, we were out at Allegheny and Frostburg last week in Salisbury. We're having conversations with, at the provost level to understand, first of all, what is the institutional commitment to OER, where do they fall on the, the X, Y axis of looking at OER in terms of cost versus looking at OER in terms of revolutionizing and transforming teaching and helping the institutions think that through a little bit and then doing what we can to help support that. So some of the ideas, for example, we are in the process right now and will be soon launching for the May 28th event, uh, a centralized OER repository the most, um, well, we're calling it a referatory because we want to be sure it's not a siloed experience, which is a place where I am really hopeful that some of those two-year and four-year conversations can occur about adoption of materials and that you'll be able to find out what other institutions in the state are using and, of course, beyond as well. But the idea being to provide that inside intel into what's happening within Maryland, too. Um, we're going to be developing, a, uh, uh, through that resource, a variety of learning communities, both discipline-based, but also, you know, a learning community for library staff, for instructional designers, and so forth. Um, and we're looking at a lot of other ways to support this work across the state, and we're really open to ideas. And I'm hoping that some of those ideas will get generated today as you're in your discussions. So, in conclusion, uh, see? Parting thoughts. I have to admit I'm not altogether sure any of this is really about OER. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, um, you know, the Kerwin Center is, is focused on change and, and supporting change in higher education. And as I look at OER, I think that's one of the mechanisms that we can use to support this kind of change. But as I said to the open ed community, at the institution level, yeah, we love it. We think free is good but we're a lot more interested in the ways in which OER can support other things, and we need that community to support us in doing that. This is where the rubber meets the road on this. As I've said before, technology, I don't think in and of itself will make a difference until we find ways to capitalize on that openness affordance in order to really change the way we teach. In order to avoid this temptation that we have as human beings, not just as educators, but as human beings, to take a new tool and use it to simply replicate what we've always done in the past. Let's try to get past simply swapping out the, OE, the textbook for OER and calling it a day and really explore the ways in which it can impact our teaching and learning as well. So that's all I have for you today. 
Thank you for your attention. This is the link to the new uh, MOST website. Um, if you're interested in, in taking a look at that as you get a chance today, it's also in your materials in the, um, in the folder. And I've got like three minutes. I told you I wasn't going to, no, do I have 15? We've got a little time for some questions if you guys are interested. Have something. For many of us um, who actually support teaching, I'm in the library, um, it has to do with sustainability of digital um, repositories and, and once these uh, materials are created, how are they going to be sustained? I mean, many faculty we find are storing them in their CMS yeah. um, and uh, so they're not all that accessible. Um, and of course, there are a lot of um, organizations out there like OER Commons mm -hmm. and, and that um, allow uh, creators to upload um, mm -hmm. and make these available. But the cost that's involved in, in sustaining these um, from a technological standpoint, uh, you know, what, what other thoughts have you encountered or are, are people talking about? Yeah, I don't, uh, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I don't think I mentioned the refer referatory will be an OER Commons based uh, uh, referatory. So we're going to be developing a mini site, as they call it. And um, that will allow also for the creation of institutional hubs, as they're calling them, where you can, each institution can have their whole, whole own identity and, and then create groups within the institution and so forth. So I'm hopeful it's going to enable a lot of networking. We actually are meeting on Monday for most of the day with the folks from ISCME who run OER Commons to, to talk through how all of this is going to work. Um, so, so I'm hopeful that as we begin rolling that out, if it is in fact useful to the institutions, that at the very least we can encourage faculty to link to materials that are in that site from the LMS instead of uploading those materials in the LMS and leaving them, as you said, stranded there behind a, a login. Um, but the, the whole question about versioning and you know, how, how do you get these resources to phone home, as I've heard it called, you know, and like actually let uh, some mothership know that, you know, that uh, MJ just changed this resource because her students didn't understand chapter four and she changed all the examples there. Um, that's a huge big conundrum that's actually being addressed to some extent at the national level, both by ISCME, again, the, the OER Commons folks, and Creative Commons. And they're all trying technologically to figure out how to do that. Um, I don't understand all the technologies behind it, but I know it has to do with indexing and meta tagging. And we're tapping library expertise because of you know, the background you all have in the library sciences in those areas. Um, so I'm hopeful some of that's going to be resolved eventually. But yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. The other big question is the introduction of bias into these kinds of materials, right? You know, or maintaining them for accessibility, you know, making sure that our faculty understand as they create new things, they could be resaving the document in a way that suddenly then makes it inaccessible. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of those kinds of things that we have to tackle. And I'm hopeful that as we do, that, that, that a collaborative like this, a statewide collaborative like this can help to support some of that work. So not a final answer to your question, but at least some things that we're thinking about um, to address those issues. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Where can I find more research that talks about not only affordability, but impact? Yep. Good question. And not question. just perception. Right, right. <laughs> So um, we have some of that on the website, I believe. Don't we have some research uploaded? Yes, yeah, so, so there is some research um, that's on, on the website, but this is still a nascent area for research. Um, what a lot of the research on student achievement and learning outcomes has been with respect to has been having access to materials on day one. Um, and of course, what they're saying is obviously if students don't have to wait three weeks for their financial aid check to arrive in order to purchase their textbook. They do better in their course, son of a gun. Um, you know, so, so, you know, that's been important work. I don't mean to belittle that, but um, I think you're absolutely right. As we continue to have this discussion about what does it mean to be able to engage in improvement, continuous improvement of our instructional materials, how will that impact our research over time? 
So here you go. This, is, this, this can be your area of research. <laughs> so, yeah, good, good. Well, and actually, um, so that's another thing that we hope to support out of the MOST initiative is, is finding those folks that are interested in doing research on that impact and coming up with a set of shared measures, uh, metrics that we would explore collectively, and perhaps also providing uh, some funding along the way um, to support that work. So we're really interested in that piece of it because that's also going to help to, to uh, power more adoptions, right? You know, you got to demonstrate that it's going to work and that, it's, that it goes beyond just do no harm um, and saving student money, that there's actually some benefit. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Behind you. I'm pleased that uh, you're establishing learning communities under this larger umbrella. And my question, uh, as well as my hope, is that it will lead to inter-institutional collaborations, mm -hmm. that the development of these materials will transcend the umbrella of individual institutions. Yes. And I'm hoping you can speak to that. Absolutely. So I, I touched on this a little bit. I don't think I was real articulate about it, but <laughs> my, my vision, I, I talk a lot about hiding the broccoli and the mashed potatoes. Did I say that earlier? You know, the, the, you know I, th these, I, I like to find ways that we can accomplish other things that we're really trying to do, like um, improve two-year, four-year conversations about transfer pathways and um, making sure that we're sharing not just instructional materials, but also um, maybe taking a hard look at learning objectives and you know what, what each course is supposed to result in for our students. So um, I'm hopeful that this work and these conversations in the learning communities can actually help to advance those conversations as well. So, Deep, what else have we been talking about? Disciplinary um, learning, learner community, or learning communities, um, uh, libraries, instructional designers, um, and anything else, quite frankly, that bubbles up, we're happy to, to help to, to do what we can to support through this work. Yeah, we're, we're doing a flexible platform, so if, if new things arise, we should be able to adapt. If people have new ideas for groups, we can accommodate that. Great, thank you. Yes. When we talk about OERs, one of the big barriers is a concern about retaining intellectual property to the extent that one wishes to do so. So there's intellectual property and then there's copyright, right? And I'm not an expert in either. Um, I, I did go to law school for a year and a half, but I'm only half a lawyer. <laughs> um, and yeah. Property law is what killed me, but I didn't even get to intellectual property discussions. So, but you know, the, the, the reality is that a Creative Commons license actually does not, what it does is it allows for the five R's, but it does not absolve the person who uses your materials from giving you credit for your intellectual property. So I still, even under the most open of the Creative Commons licenses, which is the CC BY license, it requires that attribution is given. So if Trish Westerman created something and I've now remixed, reused, revised it, I still have to give Trish attribution. So that, the intel you're not giving away the intellectual property. What you are giving away is the royalties or the, you know, any, any benefit that you would be getting financially from the development of those materials. And I'm sorry to so, um, I'm a novice at all this, but um, I, I understand that there are ways that we, one could protect one's um, OERs so that they could only be used as a whole or couldn't be revised yes. in part. So there are multiple like layers well, right? then of Creative Commons licenses and each one gets progressively more restrictive. So you can, um, and I'm not gonna remember, Deep just passed the uh, uh, Creative Commons certification uh, class, but one is um, non-derivative, which means that you can't, if, if I adopt your materials, I can't translate them into Spanish. You know, I can't create der derivative works from it. From it. One is non-commercial, so I can't myself benefit commercially from the OER. Yeah, so get into much more of the details on that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, and not to infringe on the next section, but just generally speaking that um, Creative Commons is keeping your copyright. It is just finding a way to relax it, because before people would say, I have copyright or no copyright, 
put it in the public domain. Creative Commons lets you put conditions on it. So you do have the ability. And there's even an ability to make money on Creative Commons things. For example, there are people who have released things as Creative Commons, but they sell paper copies of them. Um, and that they, you know, maybe not in the textbook world, but there are other examples. So mm -hmm. it's um, there's a lot of complexity there, and I think um, it's a little more sophisticated than just putting it on the web and you lose it. And I just want to clarify your very first statement. You said Creative Commons is keeping your copyright. Yes. It, not that Creative Commons is keeping your copyright. When you when yes, you uh, license yes. something under Creative Commons, you are keeping yes. your copyright. That's right. Just want to be clear about that. Yes. Yeah, she's behind you. <laughs> and thank you, because it's always nice to come to these and you know have great <laughs> ideas and be inspired. You're welcome. Um, I think one of the great things about being here at a community college is that um, we serve a lot of different students. And I think with the faculty that I serve, the struggle with OERs is that we have so many students with transitional need. Mm -hmm. And being able to find resources that meet them where they're at is challenging mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering is is there work that thinks about that or, or looks at how we can make that happen absolutely yeah so when you say transition transitional you mean supporting developmental pathways and things like yes. that yeah there's been a lot of work in um, developmental mathematics and in developmental uh, English uh, reading comprehension um, and I'm hopeful that you know, we've been doing a lot of work in this state around mathematics developmental pathways. Um, I would really love to begin the next step of that conversation with respect to utilizing open educational resources where it makes sense. Um, you know, and, and yeah, so there's a lot of, there actually is uh, quite a bit of good materials out there in Thank those you. areas. Thank you. All right, well, I get to come back and have the final conversation for the day as well. So I will look forward to learning from you all what you learned throughout the day. I think I need to kick it over to Fred to talk about uh, logistics now. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Thank you.